Um, I would like to begin by thanking the festival and especially Miles, who I'm looking at, and also Susan Williamson, who is the person I talked to on the phone from New York City. Of course, there's also my students and all the new people that I've met here, but I want to mention those two names. Um, it also, I want to say that um, in the last 11 years, um, this has been the time that is, which has been difficult, the last 11 years has been difficult. Um, this is the week in which, you know, I've been able to sit with sun on the back of my hair and eat beautiful salads and enjoy working with my students. And so it's a kind of um, renewal for me. And I want to thank you very much deeply. Yes, thank you. Um, also, because I'm going to try to read for 20 minutes, this might sound kind of bad of me, but it's been really difficult because I'm going, oh no, I can't read this one, I can't read this one. <laughs> but anyway, here we go. Um, I'll make some choices. I just want to say one thing about this first poem. There's the word Alma in this poem, and I just want to say that um, that um, I never knew anybody named Alma, and I never knew what the word Alma meant in Czechoslovakia or, or Spain. Um, and that I wrote this poem, and it's one of the f poems that where I didn't change one word. It's called The Girl I Call Alma. The girl I call Alma, who is so white, is good, isn't she? Even though she does not speak, you can tell by her distress that she is just like the beach and the sea, isn't she? And she is disappearing, isn't that good? And the white curtains, and the secret smile are just her way with the lies, aren't they? And that we are not alone ever, and that everything is backwards otherwise, and that inside the no is the yes, isn't it, isn't it? And that she is the God who perishes, the food we eat, the body we fuck, the loose net we throw out that gathers her, Fish, fish, white sun. Tell me we are one and that it's the others who scar me, not you. Um, I used to live, well, for, for years in uh, the 60s in the Haight-Ashbury going to school and around the corner was Stan Rice and um, Anne Rice. She became very famous later um, writing about vampires and I'm actually in one of her books, the first one. I'm, I'm the girl who gives herself willingly to the vampires. I actually didn't read the book. It frightens me, the whole thought about it. <laughs> but, but what happened, the big deal is, is that, that Stan and Anne, um, we were really good friends. Stan was a poet. Anne was trying to sort herself out in love with Alan Delon. Um, but um, uh, in the pictures, you know. Uh, but um, they had a baby uh, named Michelle um, because of the song from the Beatles. Anyway, she died. I used to babysit her, but she got leukemia and died. And so the day of the funeral, I wrote this poem for her. Um, and it's called, The Poet Goes About Her Business. Michelle has become another dead little girl, an easy poem, instant praxitalian, instant 75-year-old photograph 
of my grandmother when she was a young woman with shadows I imagined were blue around her eyes. The beauty of it, such guarded sweetness. What a greed of bruised gardenias. Oh Christ, whose name rips silk. I have seen raw cypresses, so dark the mind comes to them without color. Dark on the Greek hillside, dark, volcanic, dry, and stone. Where the oldest women of the world are standing dressed in black, up in the branches of fig trees in the gorge, knocking with as much quickness as their weakness will allow. Weakness which my heart must not confuse with tenderness. And on the other side of the island, a woman walks up the path with a burden of leaves on her head, guiding the goats with sounds she makes up and then makes up again. The other darkness is easy. The men in the dreams who come in together to me with knives. There are so many traps and many look courageous. The body goes into such raptures of obedience. But the huge stones on the desert resemble nobody's mother. I remember the snake. After its skin had been cut away and it was dropped, it started to move across the clearing, making its beautiful waving motion. It was all meat and bone. Pretty soon it was covered with dust. It seemed to know exactly where it wanted to go, toward any dark trees. Classicism. The nights are very clear in Greece. When the moon is round, we see it completely and have no feeling. If you read the poetry of um, Raymond Carver, he's written a poem called Romanticism, which is an, a mirror of this poem, except he says the opposite. Um, okay. Um, okay. Okay, I have to sacrifice, all oh, right. Um, speaking of Raymond Carver, who was most happily my friend, um, this is a poem that he liked. I know it sort of sounds vain, like, oh, she's going to name names now. But actually, I don't really try, I'm not really trying to do it that way. I'm really trying to say, isn't it wonderful that Raymond liked this poem? I mean, that's what I'm trying to do. It's not, I'm not trying to show off. Anyway, this poem is called Lies and Longing. Oh, this is a homeless shelter in New York. Lies and Longing. Half the women are asleep on the floor on pieces of cardboard. One is face down under a blanket with her feet and ankle bracelet showing. Her spear leans against the wall by her head where she can reach it. The woman who sits on a chair won't speak because this is not her dress. An old woman sings an Italian song in English and says she wants her name in lights. Faye Runaway tells about her grown children. One asks for any kind of medicine. One says she has a rock that means honor and a piece of fur. One woman's feet are wrapped in rags. One keeps talking about how fat she is so nobody will know she's pregnant. They lie about getting letters. One lies about a beautiful dead man. One lies about Denver. Outside, it's 30th Street and hot and no sun. I lived in Greece for about 10 years, um, five, and then went returned and returned. And um, this is the only poem I wrote. And I studied with Cheslav Milash. He was teaching Gnosticism. And so he liked this poem, but that's not the point. The point is, it's the only poem I wrote that kind of brings history and politics up. Usually it's all about the ancient gods and so on. Uh, but this one is about history. It's called um, Night Music. 
She sits on the mountain that is her home, and the landscapes slide away. One goes down and then up to the monastery. One drops away to a winnowing ring and a farmhouse where a girl and her mother are hanging the laundry. There's a tiny port in the distance where the shore reaches the water. She is numb and clear because of the grieving in that world. She thinks of the bandits and soldiers who return to the place they have destroyed, who plant trees and build walls and play music in the village square evening after evening, believing the mothers of the boys they killed and the women they raped will eventually come out of the white houses in their black dresses and sit with their children and the old, will listen to the music with unreadable eyes. Now, this is later in my life. Um, when I wrote a book called Chosen by the Lion, and basically this book was really um, amazing to me because I kind of contained the whole book really strangely so that I could just wake up and I'd write poem number one and then two and three and four. And it took two years, but that's what I did. And anyway, this poem, it's all about passion. This one's called The Weight. Oh, there is a joke, and that is somebody read Chosen by the Lion, and they came to me and said, thank God that you wrote a poem that wasn't about passion, you know? I mean, at least one poem. And, and, and she was referring to this poem. And I said, but, you, but, it, but you're wrong. <laughs> this one is too. <laughs> Anyway, it's called The Weight. Two horses were put together in the same paddock, night and day, in the night and in the day, wet from heat and the chill of the wind on it, muzzle to water, snorting, head swinging in the taste of bay in the shadowed air, the dignity of being. They slept that way, knowing each other always, withers quivering for a moment, Fetlock and the proud rise at the base of the tail, width of back, the volume of them and each other's weight. Fences were nothing compared to that. People were nothing. They slept standing, their throats curved against the other's rump. They breathed against each other, whinnied and stomped. There are things they did that I do not know. The privacy of them had a river in it, had our universe in it, and the way its border looks back at us with its light. This was finally their freedom, the freedom an oak tree knows that is built at night by stars. I was making this, this Oh, things in flesh. I guess, yeah, that's it. And Jack was looking at my manuscript, Jack Gilbert. And um, I had done a lot of things during those five years making this book. And so I said, well, okay, this is the Massachusetts poems. And these are, you know, the Greek poems. And these are the Java poems and all this. And he goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is not what's going to happen. We're going to have to find a thread that runs through this where you can mix these things together because it's about something other than this and that journey, you know? So anyway, but this happens to be a poem I wrote in Java where I went, I know this sounds whack, wacko, but I went to um, um, somebody who's like a seer and um, he said to me, um, well, you know, these they always tell you what to do. And um, he said, you have to go to Jogjakarta and you have to go to, uh, Perangritis, and you have to, um, you know, offer a gift and all this kind of stuff. So, so that this is a poem of my doing that, and it it's called um, "Alone with the Goddess." The young men ride their horses fast on the wet sand of Perangritis, back and forth, with the water sliding up to them and away. This is the sea where the goddess lives, angry, 
her lover taken away. Don't wear red, don't wear green here, the people say. Do not swim in the sea, give her an offering. I give a coconut to protect the man I love. The water pushes it back. I wade out and throw it farther. The goddess does not accept your gift, an old woman says. I say, perhaps she likes me and we are playing a game. The old woman is silent. The horses wear bl blinders of cloth. The young men exult in their bodies, not seeing right or left, pretending to be brave, sliding on and off their beautiful horses on the wet beach of Perangritis. Okay, you know, I got real lucky, um, uh, and, and the Lannan Foundation let me live in, in Marfa, Texas, uh, in West Texas, um, you know, with a stipend, and it was really great. And I was there for half a year, and so I walked down the same road at 5 o'clock every day. I, I kind of like repeating myself for some reason, and I talked to Jack on the phone, and I said, I'm just doing this and I'm writing poems every day. And he says, bad idea. <laughs> but I said, but I think I'm gonna do this and just see what happens. So this is one of the poems um, that came out of that wonderful experience um, in Marfa, Texas. And it's called Elegance. All that is uncared for, left alone in the stillness, in that pure silence, married to the stillness of nature, a door off its hinges, shade and shadows in an empty room, leaks for light, raw where the tin roof rusted through, the rustle of weeds in their different kinds of air in the mornings, year after year, up a con tree, and the house made out of mud bricks, accurate and unexpected beauty, rattling and singing, if not to the sun, then to nothing and to no one. Um, I do not need the gods to return. I do not need the gods to return. I have seen the fragments, have weighed them in my hand, one at a time in the heat, one at a time in the dry dirt, oregano, sage, and thyme. I don't need Orpheus to sing. I walk down the esplanade at night. I pass one loud bar after the other. On the left, the sea, bigger and stronger after dark. Orpheus put down his lyre centuries ago. Who knows what the women believe now that they are not guarded? Who can tell if it is easier now? The wide fig trees shade me either way. It has been suggested that we should go back to the source, the rain and fire that gave birth to all of it, the paintings on jars, burnt things, and Aphrodite so much like a queen, the cracking of almonds, the plowing of the fields, the broken libation cup, unbroken. I don't need the old gods to be believed, no Orpheus to sing again. And maybe I'll end with um, a slightly more ecstatic poem. <laughs> Um, I wrote this actually, I think Lucy was up there, Brock Broido, up at Bennington. I, w I like to give credit where credit is due, and I was listening, headphones, I was listen listening to John Coltrane. So I think maybe I like to praise um, Coltrane a little bit here. It's called Let Birds. Eight deer on the slope in the summer morning mist, 
the night sky blue, me like a mare led out to pasture. The Tao does not console me. I was given the way in the milk of childhood, breathing it, waking and sleeping. But now there is no amazing smell of sperm on my thighs, no spreading it on my stomach to show pleasure. I will never give up longing. I will let my hair stay long. The rain proclaims these trees. The trees tell of the sun. Let birds, let birds, let leaf be passion. Let jaw, let teeth, let tongue be between us. Let joy, let entering, let rage and calm join. Let quail come, let winter impress you, let spring. Allow the lost ocean to wake in you. Let the mare in the field in the summer morning mist make you whinny. Make you come to the fence and whinny. Let birds. Thank you. Thank you.